So welcome back to the .NET Conf bunker here at Channel 9. It's uh, Late. It's, it's about 4 in the morning here, Pacific Standard Time. But we are having an amazing time with .NET Conf. Thanks so much, everybody that's tuning in, wherever you are around the world. We're broadcasting now so that it's a lot more convenient for you. You've got folks from your regions, your areas presenting to you. We've got folks on six of the seven continents. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's it amazing. is awesome. We couldn't get we couldn't get Antarctica. Couldn't get Antarctica. I tried. I have friends there that hang out with penguins, but they were a little busy with the penguins. Look at um, that. It's almost lunchtime in the UK. It's good stuff. It's good oh, stuff. man. And I think that's, where's our next talk coming from? I think our next talk is coming from London. We're going to be going to, you know what, let, let's see if we can start bringing them in now. We're going to be going to Mete in London. I love the flyover. Effect. We got the fly in. Absolutely. Brilliant. Did you pre program each one of those or did we just go to All that of them. location? Absolutely. You like the script, Kitty. Man. There we go. Hey, good morning. Good, happy lunchtime, Mete. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Good. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, shall I start, or you guys? Absolutely, it's all yours. You have the conference. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great. Uh, that's why I love online conferences. You know, because you, you're, the whole world is your audience, basically. Um, so I don't know where people are, but I'm based in London. It's lunchtime in London, but it's I'm sacrificing my lunch so I can talk to you guys because I did this conference last year. Uh, last year I talked of, uh, about. Um, ASP.NET Core containers on Kubernetes, and it was a lot of fun. So I'm very happy to be here again today. Um, my name is Meta Tamel. I am a developer advocate at Google. Um, this is my Twitter. I already have the slides, a version of the slides on my Twitter. So if you want to get the slides, just follow me. Um, the application that I'm going to show is already on GitHub. I don't know if you can see this at, at the bottom of my slides. Um, and I'm going to, at the end of my talk, we'll also provide the link to that as well. So if you want to run the app yourself, Look at the code, all that kind of stuff. You can get it from on, on GitHub. Um, to save some bandwidth, I'm going to um, turn off my video, and then we'll start the um, presentation. So let me do that. I think that worked. And let me move this around. OK. All right, so the talk is about connecting this time, I'm still talking about .NET containers, but this time connecting Google Home device to a .NET container. And you might be wondering, like, where is this coming from? How, how did you get this idea? Oh, OK, sorry about that. So let me, let me turn that on. Can you see it now? Is it? You see my camera, but oh, I had to do screen, sh screen sharing, I guess. Let's see. I haven't used Skype for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, hold on. Um, where do I get the screen sharing in Skype? Share screen, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Uh, now I can uh, turn off the video. Now everything should be good. <laughs> right? OK. Cool. Now you should be able to see my screen. Um, so anyway, so what I, say, what I was saying is that um, so me and my coworker, Chris Bacon, he's a, a C Sharp developer in Google Cloud uh, Libraries team. We wanted to do a talk at the beginning of the year. And we were thinking something cool to show. And then we said, OK, well, Google Home is kind of hot nowadays. And why don't we just look into Google Home, see if we can program it, you know? Um, so that's how the idea started. Initially, we thought it would be really difficult because, you know, when you talk about a device like a Google Home, you need to talk to it. It needs to understand what you're saying. Then, you know, once you get the input from the user, you need to parse it, try to understand what the user is saying, get the entities out of, out of the words. And then you need to somehow respond to that, right? So just thinking about this, um, our initial assumption was that this would be quite difficult to do. Um, but we got the Hello World application working really quickly. And then we were like, OK, what else we can do with this? And then, then the idea came along. You know, we, have the, we have the device, people talking to it. We have the cloud with all the big data and all machine learning, all, all the APIs and everything that the cloud provides. 
So what does it take to connect it to the cloud? Um, again, initially, our idea was that it would, it would take a long time, but it was really quick. Uh, we were able to relay a user's request to the cloud quite fast. And then from then on, it was, it was pure fun. Uh, we basically said, OK, let's use some machine learning to do something interesting, and then let's use some big data processing to elevate the Google Home application. And in the end, we have this application. So this talk is about that. Uh, we'll, we'll go through it and see how it works. But before I start my presentation, I want to first make sure that my, my application is working. I don't have a Google Home device here right now, but I'm going to use a simulator. So what I'm going to do is let me lower this. So here, this is a Google, well, Google Assistant simulator. So I'm going to be using this. And I also have a front end for my application that I'll show you later. So first, let's um, start with this. Um, one thing to mention, when you write an application for Google Home, um, you need to choose a phrase that triggers your application. Because normally, when you talk to a Google Home device, uh, if you ask something like, how is the weather, that will be handled by Google, right? Because Google has the weather data, so that will be handled by Google. But if at some point you want, to, you want the control to go to your application, then there has to be some key phrases that triggers your application. So for example, if you write a stock application, you would say, talk to my stock application. Or if it's a shopping application, you would say, talk to my shopping application, something like that. Um, but since this is a test application, the way you would test the test applications is that you would just say, talk to my test application. That's how you start. So that's why every time, not every time, but most of the times when I show this, I have to say, talk to my test application so that I can trigger, I can move the control to my test. So let's do that. And the cool thing about the simulator is that you can type it or you can talk to it. Uh, so I usually try to talk, but sometimes if it, if it doesn't understand me, then I will type it. So we'll see what happens. So let's just start with talk to my test application. Or you can also click on this. So it's telling me there's a suggested input. So let's, let's just click on it to make it easy. OK, let's get the test version of my test app. Hello from Google Home meets .NET containers app. Yeah, so as you can see, this hello from Google Home meets .NET Containers app, it's coming from my application. So at this point, the control is in my application. Um, so let's just ask something to our application. Can you say hi to everyone? Hello .NET conference people all over the world. Great to be here today. Great. So it, it seems that my application is working. So we'll get back to this. Uh, I just want to double check that everything is working. So let's go back to the presentation. So before I get into details, I just want to give you an overview of how this application looks like and get some terminology straight. Um, so first of all, I am talking like the idea of our application was that we would talk to Google Home application um, and then that would be caught by Google Assistant. Actually, all these applications, uh, I call them Google Home applications, but they're actually Google Assistant applications. Google Assistant is the thing that captures the voice uh, on many devices. Uh, for example, if you have an Android phone, then you would have Google, Google Assistant there. If you have Google Home, you would have Google Assistant there. The simulator has it. So any device that has Google Assistant has this application enabled, basically. So what happens is that the user talks to the device that they have, whatever it is, then it goes to Google Assistant. And at that point, Google Assistant decides, is this something I'm going to handle? Or is this something I need to pass in to a custom application? If it's a Google kind of information like how is the weather or what's the stock price of uh, you know uh, Google or something like that, then that will be handled directly by Google. But then if you trigger your application, then the control will pass to your application. Um, in this case, I'm using something called Dialogflow, and we'll talk about Dialogflow. But basically, from Google Assistant, if you want to extend Google Assistant, you would use something called Actions on Google. Actions on Google is the framework to extend Google Assistant. Um, and then there's something else called Dialogflow, which is a framework even for, like that wraps Actions on Google. And I'm going to explain the differences of what Actions on Google is and what Dialogflow is and why we use Dialogflow. But eventually, the control goes to Dialogflow. And Dialogflow, in a similar way, uh, it makes the same kind of um, decision. It, it first tries to see if it can handle the user's response within Dialogflow. And if it can, it will just handle it and return the response back. Uh, if not, it can also call an endpoint. Um, and that endpoint, it, it can be, it can live anywhere, um, but it has to be an HTTPS endpoint. That's the only requirement. So 
A request comes in, dialog box says, okay, can I handle this? If it can, it will handle it. Otherwise, it will pass it to this HTTPS endpoint that you defined. And then from then on, the code handles the response, the, the, the user's request. Um, in our case, we are running an ASP.NET Core application in Google Cloud. And this application, um, it's basically an ASP.NET Core container. Um, we deployed it on App Engine, uh, but you can also deploy it on something like Kubernetes engine as well. So you can run on Kubernetes as well. As long as it's HTTPS, it doesn't really matter where it's running. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the differences between the two and why we deployed to App Engine. And then from then on, uh, once we made that connection, we basically integrated with Google Search to search for some images that I'm going to show. Then we integrated with Vision API to get some intelligence out of the images using machine learning. Then we integrated with BigQuery to analyze uh, some big data and get some intelligence back to the user. And finally, um, no application um, is complete without logging, tracing, monitoring, and debugging, right? So for that, we integrated with Stackdriver, and that gives us all the things that we need to maintain the application. So in a nutshell, this is the application, and I just want to take you through this journey of how we built this application and what kind of stuff you can do with it, all right? So let's first talk about Dialogflow. What is Dialogflow? Um, Dialogflow, it's an end-to-end -end de development platform for building conversational applications. So if you want to build an app for Google Home, or if you want to build an app, a chatbot, or something like that, where people can actually talk to it, or they can also type to it, like they can also text to it, then you can use Dialogflow. Uh, the great thing about Dialogflow is that it has integration with many uh, technologies. So it has integration with Google Assistant that I'm going to show. But you can also integrate it with Skype, or you can integrate it with Slack, or you can integrate it with Twitter. So there's lots of integration points. So you can use Dialogflow as like the one thing that you can use to integrate with many places. In this demo, I'm only um, integrating with Assistant, but I think it's useful to know that you know you can integrate with multiple sources if you want to. Uh, it works on phones, it works on uh, home devices. It, it pretty much tries to work on every, everywhere it can. And it also tries to work all around the world. So it's not a US only service or it's not a Europe only service. It, work, it works across the globe and you know, it supports multiple languages as well. Um, I mean, it doesn't support every single language, but there's a list of languages. I think it's like 10 languages right now and, it's, and the list is growing as well. Um, and as I mentioned, Dialogflow, it's a channel for Google Assistant. So you can use actions on Google SDK to program Google Assistant, and that works. But actions on Google SDK is kind of limited. Um, it basically, like when you use it, it will get you what user said, but then you need to make sense of what the user said yourself. And then you need to program that yourself. So it's not so easy. Whereas Dialogflow, it provides um, natural language processing. So you can actually extract entities out of these, um, these text, uh, these uh, expressions that the user said. But it also um, provides a really nice UI where you can you can define the conversation in a, in a in a in a UI basically instead of doing it in, in all in code. And I'm going to show this uh, shortly. So that's why we we try to use Dialogflow because it makes it really easy to kind of integrate what user said and extract things and um, display them. Um, so I mentioned the natural language processing in Dialogflow. So for example, if you say something like book a flight from Los Angeles to Hawaii for less than $300. What Dialogflow does is that it, it, first of all, it detects this, and then it tries to extract entities from this expression. So in this uh, expression, Los Angeles is a city, so it will pick out the fact that this is a city, Hawaii is a state, and then $300, it's, it's amount and it's, like it's currency, basically. So it will pick those out for you, and it will give them to your application to process. And that's very useful because you can literally like mark what you want to be extracted and it will do that job for you. So you don't have to do that yourself. And it's quite smart. You don't actually have to give the full list of things that it should extract. You just give some examples and it learns from it. And I'm gonna show you this uh, shortly. All right, so that's Dialogflow. Um, what I wanna do is um, I want to show you the Dialogflow console first. So there's a console for Dialogflow. Um, so this is where you would start your, your um, project. Um, the first thing that you need to do is you need to create an agent. Um, you can think of agent as kind of like the project or your application. Here I have two agents. One is a Hello World agent and the other one is a Google Home Meets.net uh, agent. Um, in the agent you have like um, 
the description of the agent, the time zone, the language, stuff like that. Um, and there's also different APIs that you can use, but I, I'm using the latest V2 API. Um, so once you have the basic agent, you don't you usually don't need need to change much here. Uh, what you can do though is that you can export and import agents. So once you have your agent set up the way you want, you can actually export it uh, in a zip file, and someone can import it and use it. And actually, if you get the code for this application, I have the agent exported already for you. So you can just simply open Dialogflow and import my agent, and you have all this stuff that I'm showing to you uh, from the zip file. So once you have the agent, then you need to tell uh, the agent what kind of things that it should listen for, right? And those are called intents. So if you look at under intents, there are a couple of things to note. First is there's something called default welcome intent. This is the intent that gets triggered when you say, talk to my test app or talk, talk to my stock application or something like that. When you say that, then it will trigger this default welcome intent. Uh, if you look at here, so there's a, this is the welcome intent and the response is, you will define the response here. So here I'm saying hello from Google Home meets .NET containers app. So this is the response that I defined. So that's how we can trigger this. Um, this is an intent that's solely handled in Dialogflow. So a request comes in, like it, I say talk to my test app, it goes to Dialogflow and Dialogflow can handle directly right here uh, using this text. The other one is um, default fallback intent. So if you say something to Dialogflow and the Dialogflow doesn't understand it, then it will fall back here. Uh, so it's kind of like the default way of you know, handling a request. Um, and here, as you can see, there's no request or there's no training phrase or anything like that. There's only responses. So when you say something that the dialogue for doesn't understand, then it will pick one of these text responses and it will just say something like, you know, what was that? I didn't get that. I missed that. Stuff like that. But you can choose whatever you want in here. And the last thing I want to show here is the Remember I said, say hi to everyone. Uh, for that, I use this greeting.conference intent. So if you look at this intent, um, the first thing that you realize is that I have some training phrases. So the training phrases are greet everyone, say hi to everyone, say hi. So any of these phrases will trigger this, but not just these phrases, anything that's similar to this. So if, you, if I say, say hello to everyone, it will still trigger this. I, that's what I like about dialogue for, is that you just give it examples, you don't list everything. But if you say something like this, then it will get here and the re text response again will be handled by uh, dialogue for. So that's, that's what we have. Um, let me go back to my presentation now. So we, we got the initial dialogue for application uh, working quite quickly. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to connect it to the cloud. And then, you know, nowadays, like containers is the default way of, uh, for many people, yeah, is the default way of like packaging and running applications. So I just want to talk about containers on Google Cloud briefly and the choices that we made. And then I'm going to show you more stuff. Um, so basically, what we did is that we created an ASP.NET Core application. Um, and we deployed it to, to App Engine, but it can also work on Google Kubernetes Engine. And I just want to briefly cover what the differences are. Um, so when it comes to deploying your code on Google Cloud, this is kind of like the spectrum that you have. Uh, on the spectrum, uh, on one side, you have Compute Engine, which is basically virtual machines on Google Cloud. Uh, you can have Windows virtual machines, Windows Server virtual machines with different versions. You can have a bunch of different Linux kind of virtual machines. And you can also have container optimized virtual machines. So if you want to run containers on a VM for whatever reason, you can do that as well. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Cloud Functions. Uh, these are basically serverless Node.js or Python functions that you can deploy and you don't care where they're running. They're just automatically maintained and run by Google for you. And then in the middle, we have App Engine and Kubernetes. So these are kind of like the two choices that you have when it comes to running containers. Um, the easiest way to run containers is App Engine. So in App Engine, you basically just define your application define a Docker file and just say gcloud app deploy and it will deploy it to App Engine. Um, under the covers, App Engine will run your containers on two VMs, but it will automatically scale up to 20 VMs. But all that is abstracted away from you, so you don't have to worry about that. And then there's Kubernetes Engine for those people who want to run containers on Kubernetes. Um, and the choice is really up to you, like you can do both. If you want more control, you probably want to go with Kubernetes Engine. 
But if you want just ease of use and you, you just want to say, okay, this is my code, just run it, then you will probably go with App Engine. Um, so App Engine, what does it give to you? It, it basically, you just say, this is my container, uh, run it, and it will just run your container, and it will scale it for you automatically. It gives you dashboards, it gives you versions, so every time you, you deploy your application, you have multiple versions. Uh, once you have the versions, you can do traffic splitting, uh, and it has auto-scaling. So it gives you the default things that you want uh, with just a single command. You just say gcloud app deploy, and by that, you get all these features. And if you want more control, as I mentioned, you, you can use Kubernetes. And I think in the previous talk, we talked about Kubernetes, so I'm not going to cover it too much, but it's basically one of the most popular open source container management platforms. And there's something called Google Kubernetes Engine, which you can think of as Kubernetes as a service. Um, it's Kubernetes maintained by Google for you. So you, with a single command, you can get a Kubernetes cluster with master and worker nodes, and you can deploy your containers using kubectl, just like any other Kubernetes cluster. So these are the options that you have. Um, we, so let's ask our application where it is running. Um, so I will go back to my um, my um, simulator. And this is the front end of my application. So we have a simple front end, ASP.NET front end. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ask my application where it's running. Where are you running? Running on Google App Engine. Project ID is home meets .NET containers. Yeah, as you can see now, it's telling us that it's running on App Engine. Um, so we kind of made the connection from our application, from Google Home, Dialogflow, to the cloud now. And I want to show you briefly uh, what kind of things you need to make this connection. And then we'll move on with more interesting things with machine learning and big, big data. So first, let's go to um, Dialogflow console again. So one thing that you realize is that in Dialogflow Console, in one of the intents, I have something called platform.describe. So this is the intent that handles uh, when I say, what environment are you running in, or where are you running, things like that. So when you say that, um, it will trigger this intent. And then, as you can see, there's no response here. So there's no text response. But what's happening is that there's this checkbox here that says, enable webhook call for this intent. So that says to Dialogflow, don't try to handle this yourself. Just call this webhook that I want you to call, right? And where is this webhook? Uh, it's defined under here, fulfillment. So in fulfillment, there's a URL that you have to enter. It's, it has to be HTTPS. So this is basically my app engine endpoint uh, that I already deployed that, that's going to handle the webhook calls from Dialogflow. Uh, by the way, I should also mention there's an inline editor here where you can also define a function uh, in Node.js in here, and you can deploy it to Google Cloud using something called Firebase. So you can basically define the function in here and just deploy it right from here. And it's the easiest way to basically define webhooks uh, right from here. But we chose not to do this because we're going to have lots of intents with lots of logic in them. And trying to do that all of that in here, it doesn't make sense. So that's why we also uh, we wanted to do it separately uh, um, ourselves. Also, to be honest, I mean, who wants to write Node.js when you have C Sharp, right? I mean, I know some people are going to uh, yell at me for that. But I mean, when you have C Sharp, you want to write in C Sharp, at least for me. So that's why we didn't bother with this one. All right. So that's the um, so that's how you define the webhook. Um, and now at this point, it will get into our code. So let me just show you some of our code. So this is this code is on GitHub, by the way. Uh, but let me just show you the flow. So what happens? So we have um, this is an ASP.NET Core web app. And we have a conversation controller. So this conversation controller is the, is the thing that handles the conversation calls from Dialogflow, OK? So it will basically get here, this conversation route. And then we'll get the HTTPS request right here. And this will call Dialogflow app handle request. So let's look at Dialogflow app. So under Dialogflow folder, there is a Dialogflow app. And if you look at the handle request, it gets the HTTPS request. And what it tries to do is it tries to extract a webhook request from the body of the HTTP request. What is this webhook request? Um, it's basically a Dialogflow thing. So if you look at, it at the top of our file, there is a Google Cloud Dialogflow v2 um, NuGet package that we're using. Um, so once I have that package, I can, I can use that and I can extract the webhook request, so basically the contents of the Dialogflow request 
from the body of the HTTP request. Um, so once I have that, I have things like the session. So every conversation has a session in Dialogflow, and I can see the intents and the intents name and things like that. So I have the basically the context of the call uh, from from this web request. So what's happening here is that I have the session ID from Dialogflow. And what I need to do is I need to decide whether this is a new new conversation. Someone is just they just started talking to me right now or whether it's an existing conversation. So this method get or create conversation figures out whether to create a conversation or to get an existing conversation. And once we have the conversation, either way, we call the handle async method. So we are passing the request down the chain. So if you look at the conversation, it gets the web hook request and it takes the intent name. From the request and now we want to match the intent that we define in dialog flow to a handler on the server right so this find handler method does that it looks at the intent name and it finds a handler for it how it does it um, i'm not going to go through the code the code is here if you want to take a look at it but in a nutshell if you look at the intents so all the intents are, un are under the intents folder and if you look at the platform describe handler you will realize that at the top there is an intent tag, and this intent tag has the same intent name as the one in Dialogflow. So by having this intent tag with this value, we are basically matching the intent of Dialogflow to a handler on the server. That's how it happens. So we'll get here, and we'll get the request here. And what we are doing here is that this platform .instance async it's a Google Cloud API call. So Google Cloud is basically figuring out where we are running. And at this point, we, it will figure out the fact that we are running on App Engine. And then once we have the, the detailed description of where we are running, we do two things. We have Dialogflow show call. This will display um, on the web page whatever we pass. So I, we pass in the text we get and display it on the, on the page. And we also return a web, webhook response. And we say fulfillment text. So this fulfillment text is basically telling Dialogflow, just say what I, whatever I told you to say. So this spoken description here is what I'm telling Dialogflow to say. OK, so that's, what, that's, that's the whole chain. Like Dialogflow goes to an HTTPS endpoint. From HTTPS endpoint, we go through the conversation. From conversation, we go to the intent handler. And from intent handler, we handle however we want. And then we just return a webhook response to Dialogflow. And that's it. Dialogflow will just say whatever we, we want to say. All right? OK, so now we got, um, let me go back to my presentation one sec. Now at this stage, we have our dialog flow connected to Google Cloud running on App Engine. So things can get more interesting. And this is the part of the talk that I have the most fun with. So what we're going to do is, at this stage, we said, OK, let's just see what we can use on Google Cloud to make this more interesting. And the first thing that we looked at is the machine learning APIs. Um, so on Google Cloud and in other clouds as well, there is this APIs for for consuming machine learning. Um, by consuming machine learning, I mean, you know, usually when you want to do machine learning, you need to have data, you need to be able to determine what you want to do with that data, then you need to be able to train that data using machine learning. Then once you have a trained model, then you need to expose that model using an API. And once you have that API, then you can consume that intelligence that you got from machine learning, right? That's a lot of work. But then you can also rely on what's called machine learning APIs. These are APIs that expose a model that's already been trained for you. Uh, so for example, there's something called cloud speech to text. Uh, all, what it does is that it, it, it takes the voice and it turns that into text using machine learning. It uses a model that Google already built to do that. Same thing for text to speech. So you can convert text to a human sounding speech. Um, and there's video intelligence API that you can extract intelligence from videos. Natural language is also, also really good. You can pass in some text in English and it can detect whether the text is you know, a positive text or negative text or whether it's neutral, um, the things, things like that about the text. And my favorite is the Vision API. So in Vision API, you can pass in an image and it will try to extract information about that image. Um, just to show you an example, so there's a demo. Uh, you can actually go to this demo yourself as well called Vision Explorer. And what we can do in Vision Explorer is that we can pass in some um, images and we can see what, what we get back. So for example, we pass in an image of a cat 
And what you get back is basically something like this, just a JSON with some text, with some descriptions and scores. But if you look at it in detail, in graphical way, we can see that we get some labels. Uh, so we pass this image to Vision API, and what we got is uh, some labels. And Vision API is telling us that it's a cat, 99% of 99% sure. Uh, it's an animal, 96%. And it also knows that it's a British short hair cat, 93%. So it gives you quite accurate information about the image. It gives you the colors in the image, uh, the dominant colors in the image. And it also tells you whether this image is an adult image or a medical image or violent image, stuff like that. Uh, if you pass in um, an image with text, then it can extract text from the image as well. So for example, in this one, we have... Um, we have this traffic sign. So Vision API is telling us that this is traffic sign 90%, 90% but it also picked up the text and it tells you also the where in the image the text is, right? So it can give you that as well. And the last thing I want to show is that if you pass in people to Vision API, um, it, can detect, it can detect people's expressions. Uh, for example, this one, it figured out that it's a social group, 98% and maybe folk dance, 56%, which is pretty good. But for me, the interesting part is that if you turn this on, then it can detect people's faces, but it can also detect people's expressions. So person one, which is the person here, uh, Vision API is telling us that it's, the person is very neutral, so there's not, not much expression, which, which, which seems to be true. And the person two, which is this person, is joyful because she's smiling. Uh, so you can get this kind of information from Vision API. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to basically use Vision API and what we did is, uh, well, instead of me talking about it, let me just show you what we did and then I can explain the details afterwards. So let's go back to my um, simulator and I will say, let's let's try. Okay, move this around. I want to use Vision API. Uh, Okay, you can ask Vision API to search for images first. What do you want to search for? Search for images of London. Found some pictures of London. Now, select a picture. Select second picture. Picture 2 selected. You can describe, show landmarks, or ask whether the image is safe. So what happened right now is that we use Google Custom Search to search for images of London. And we got some images. We pick one. And now I'm going to use Vision API to describe the image, get the labels out of it, and do a landmark detection to see if there's a landmark, and also do a safety check whether this image is safe or not. So let's see if it works. Can you describe the image? This picture is labeled city, cityscape, landmark, tourist attraction, skyline, urban area, Ferris wheel, metropolis, bridge, and metropolitan area. So that seems pretty accurate. And then let's see if there are any landmarks here. Are there any landmarks in this picture? This picture contains London Eye. Okay, one interesting thing is that um, it picked up, it, it thought it, I said, are there any rabbits in this picture? But somehow it went to landmark detection. I don't know how that happened, but it works. <laughs> and then let's do the safety check now. Is the picture safe? Let's see. This picture is fine. Yeah, so it's telling us that the picture is fine. So yeah, we just use machine learning in our application. And let me just show you quickly how this looks in the code. Uh, well, before the code, let's look at the dialog flow um, console first. So we can close this. So if you look at the dialog flow console, start with intents. So we have a number of vision related intents. Um, the first one is vision.intro. Um, so this one, when you say I want to use vision API, it will trigger this. And all it does is it will set what's called an input context and an output context. So input context in, a, in an intent means that this intent will only be triggered when you have this input context. In this case, this intent will be triggered no matter what, right? But the output context means that when this intent gets called, at the end of it, it will set this vision context. 
So when you say I want to use a vision API, it basically sets the context to vision. All right. So that's all it does. And this is important because if you look at the other other vision um, intents, the first thing that we do is vision vision search. So the vision vision search has vision context as input, right? So this will be only triggered if we are in vision context. So that's how you can control what gets triggered when, right? And then it also has some output context like search and vision. Um, but one cool thing here is that the training phrases here in vision.search is that I say, let's see some dogs, dogs pictures. You know, as you can see, like I didn't say dogs in my um, demo, I said London. But what's happening is that we are marking this uh, we are providing these uh, expressions and we are marking dog as special entity that we want Dialogflow to pick for us, right? And this entity, we call it search term, right? So, and what happens is that the Dialogflow will say, you know, when you say, show me images of London, it will pick London and it will, it will um, insert it as search term in the request and we can pick that search term and use it later, right? So the, this is the entity detection of Dialogflow that we're getting uh, for free, which is nice. Um, and then let me show you the other in intents as well, and then we'll look at the code. So that's image search. And once we search the image, we select the image. That's not that interesting. It's basically selecting one of the images. And then vision.describe is the one that actually makes the call to vision API. So in here, as you can see, the context is vision.select. So this only gets called when we have an image that we selected otherwise this intent doesn't get called which makes sense and then these are the phrases that uh, triggers this um, intent uh, su such as describe this image and then response is a webhook call right there's no response our code will handle this and it's true for the other ones as well if you look at the vision.landmarks this will also like uh, be triggered and it will it will be we will be calling our code as well. So now we can actually look at our code. Let's go to Visual Studio Code. In here, um, under intents, there's a vision folder, and then let's look at the search first. So if you look at the search, eventually um, the request will the web request will end up in this method. And what we are doing is that we are picking up the search term. So this is a search term that was picked up by Dialogflow and passed to us, right? So we pick that up. And then what we do is we create a search client. So this is a Google custom search API um, that, that we are using. We are searching for images. We get some images back. And then we display that image in our front end. And then we send a response to Dialogflow. And so this is basically what, what we want Dialogflow to say. And it will say, find some pictures of London. Now select the picture, right? So that's how you search it. It's quite easy. Then vision select will Basically, we don't have to look at the details, but it will basically, when you say select the first picture, that will be passed in as index from Dialogflow, and then we'll use that index to select the picture. And then the machine learning happens in Describe. So in Describe, one thing that you'll first realize is that we are using google.cloud.vision.v1. So that's the NuGet package to talk to Vision, Vision API. And what we are doing is that we get the request again, we create a vision client. So this is the, the actual class we use to call the vision API. And we just make a single call. In this case, detect labels async. So this says, given this image, which you basically just point to the image URL, uh, we just say, call label detection on this image. And this gives us some labels. Uh, and then we just basically take, take those labels and we just say, this picture is labeled. Blah, 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 blah. We just talk about that, right? So that's it. It's just one API call to Vision API. Um, same thing with landmark detection. If you look at landmark detection, again, Vision Client detect landmarks, uh, almost the same kind of code. And safe detection is also the same. So if you look at safety detection, have a client and detect safe search async, that's it. So it's cool that we can do machine learning with, with a single call, but that's what the machine learning APIs are, are for. Um, and yeah, that's what we use. So that was one. Um, the second that, that, that we wanted to use was BigQuery. Um, let me go back to my presentation briefly. So BigQuery is uh, Google's, um, so that's Vision API. Yeah, so BigQuery is Google's uh, massively parallel processing engine, basically. So the idea of BigQuery is that you ingest your data. And in this case, I mean like terabytes of data. BigQuery works 
better and better with more and more data. So if you have lots of data, you can ingest it. And BigQuery stores it. It has a lot of storage behind it, and it has a lot of compute behind it. And the idea is that you run SQL queries against this big data, uh, and it runs really fast because BigQuery is really optimized to take the query, uh, split the query into small queries, and, and just run it as fast as possible, right? So it, And it's fully managed, so you don't have to worry about clusters, machines, anything like that. Um, and the thing about BigQuery is that it comes with um, it comes with public data sets. So if you look at if you go to this page uh, on Google Cloud, uh, BigQuery public data, there's all this public data that's available in BigQuery that you can use to try it out or, or even use in your application if you want um, on things like GitHub data, for example. You can search for all GitHub uh, commits and everything that's on GitHub. It's um, ingested in BigQuery. There's Hacker News. So all, everything on Hacker News is ingested. So we wanted to use some of these. Um, and actually, um, before I show the application, I want to point out to one of my coworkers, uh, Felipe Hoffa. He's a, also a developer advocate in my group. He actually analyzed um, GitHub data using BigQuery, and he figured out which companies um, are the top contributors to, to open source uh, using GitHub data. And he, he has a blog post about it that he explains. Um, what what you can do is basically you can I mean I won't go into details but what you can go to Google Cloud and you can go to BigQuery and let's just go here BigQuery and then I just copied and pasted his his um, his SQL statement so I have one here GitHub top contributors uh, let's just move this around so if you look at the the this is just a SQL statement. It's quite complicated, but he explains what he does in, in the blog post. But if you run the query, now this is going to look at the GitHub um, data, and it will run. It will basically look at all the commits. It will look at the emails attached to the commits, and it will try to figure out if the person has a company email, like at google.com or at microsoft.com, and it will count it, and it will display like what company has the most contrib contribution. Um, and it, this ran. Uh, and it looks like Microsoft has the top contribution with Google uh, close second and Red Hat and IBM and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. But what's even more cool is that this query completed in 20 seconds, it analyzed, it processed like almost 900 gigs of data, right? And I did this with just one click. And to me, that's really impressive. So we wanted to use this in our application. Again, instead of me talking about it, let me just show you what we did. So first thing that I want to do do is I want to say, I want to search for news. Okay, you can ask BigQuery about top hacker news or global temperatures on a certain day. So yeah, in BigQuery, there's like two public data sets that we were interested in. One was hacker news. We wanted to search everything that happened on hacker news. And there's another data set was global temperatures. So there's a data set where, you know, we, we keep like, well, the data set keeps track of all the global temperatures in all countries since like 1910 or something like that. So let's try Hacker News first. What was top Hacker News on May 1st, 2018? Now it's it's running the SQL statement seen here. And now the big critical is going. Scan 697 megabytes in 4.6 seconds. The top title on Hacker News was titled Amazon Threatens to Suspend Signal's Oz Account Over Censorship Circumvention. Interesting. Yeah. So you can see like we are running SQL and we got some stats about this, the BigQuery run. And then we are displaying the top 10 Hacker News on May 1st, 2018. And that was pretty quick. And the second one is like the global temperature. So let's ask about that as well. What was the hottest temperature in USA in 2016? Now it's running another SQL statement against the global temperature. Scanned 5,271 megabytes in 2.9 seconds. Yeah. The hottest temperature in United States of America in the year 2016 was 48.7 degrees Celsius at the Stovepipe Wells 1SW monitoring station. Yeah, I don't know where that is, but I that looks like a really high number. Like 48 degrees is probably like 120, 130 Fahrenheit, I guess. I don't know, but that's a lot. And you can ask like coldest temperature as well and, and in pretty much any country. And 
the way we did this again, just to show you briefly, is that if we go to dialog for console, intent, so BigQuery intro sets the BigQuery context, just like before. And then once we have the context, there is, uh, let's look at hacker news. So the hacker news gets called when we are in BigQuery context. And the training phrase is what was on hacker news yesterday, what was the top hacker news yesterday. We are just picking up the date. Uh, and again, like here, I'm not, like here I'm giving one example with a date, but you can also say yesterday. And as long as you, you mark these and you, you tell dialog flow, just pick this thing as date. It will figure out what yesterday is and it will give you a proper date. Uh, that's the cool thing about it. So we basically pick up the date and we pass it to BigQuery code that, we, um, that I'm going to show you. Um, and the same thing with the temperatures. Um, in temperatures, we have more things to look for. So we are looking for the hottest temperature in France in 2015. So we are picking up hottest or coldest or highest or lowest. And we are picking up country, so France, and we are picking up um, the year, right? So the entities are more complicated here. But again, Dialogflow is doing the work for us. And by the way, if you say in 2015, what was the highest temperature? And if you don't say the country, then Dialogflow will prompt and say which country, which is pretty cool as well. So you, because these are marked as required, right? So since they are marked as required, Dialogflow will make sure that the user provides that. So I don't have to worry about that myself. All right. And just to look at the code again, we go to BigQuery. Let's look at the Hacker News first. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use the BigQuery um, NuGet package on, that we have. And then it will get into handle async. We will, from the request, the webhook request that Dialogflow gives us, we pick up the date. That's the only thing that we are interested in in Hacker News. Then we create a BigQuery client that we'll use to talk to uh, BigQuery. We specify the table, the public data sets that, that we want to get the information from. We define the SQL statement and we define the parameter, in this case, the date. So that's the only thing that we pass it to SQL statement. And we show the query in our web page and then we start the clock so that we can time how long it takes. And then we execute the query and then we get the results. And in the end, we show the query to people in, in the browser and we also do a response. So the fulfillment text will say, well, the fulfillment text, so, so Dialogflow will basically just say the stats about the query. So scan this many megabytes in this amount of time, stuff like that. Um, and the same thing with the global temperatures. The only thing that's different in global temperatures really is that there's more things to extract from the requests. Um, so that logic is um, here. So I'm looking at, all the things that Delpho should provide to me and doing some kind of error checking. So if there's something that the Delpho is not giving to me, then I'm gonna um, say something. And the rest is pretty much the same. I won't show you the, the rest of the code because it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we got, we got BigQuery um, integrated. Um, and the last thing that I wanna show you, uh, I wanna wrap up in five minutes, but I want to make sure that you show I show this to you because it's kind of important. You know, this is all cool. Like we can integrate with cloud, we have machine learning, we have big data, but this all of this means nothing if you cannot maintain your application. So for that, we thought that it was really important to use something like Stackdriver to, to maintain our application. And what is Stackdriver? It's basically Google Cloud's monitoring, logging, debugging, error reporting, tracing tool. Um, so logging is it's like a central place where all the logs can go. Uh, error reporting is anything that you you throw from your application that's not caught it will be reported here and you get stats about the errors. Tracing is um, HTTP tracing. So all the calls into your application will be traced and you can see the stats about them as well. And finally, the thing that I want to show you is debugging. So you can actually point to your code on GitHub and get that uh, loaded in your browser, put a breakpoint and get a snapshot on, on a live application running in the cloud, okay? So let's just, I just want to in five minutes just show you quickly what we have here. But before that, um, to enable Stackdriver, all I have to do is in my application, if I go to not startup to do program.cs, yeah, when I create my application, I just say use Google Diagnostic, pass in my project ID, service name, and the version of my application, and that's it. This will enable Stackdriver for me, right? So by with this, I have my Stackdriver enabled. Um, and also in your Docker file, you need to start 
if you want to use debugger, you need to start in a special way, but it's very it's basically just you wrap .NET call with start dash debugger and, and that's it. And once you do that, what you get is that I come here, I go to stack driver uh, in Google Cloud Console. So let's look at logging first. So logging, not exciting, but it's useful. Um, it's a central place where you can see like, this is my app engine application version six on my application. And I can see all my logs. I can do search and stuff like that here, which is really useful. Um, the other thing is the um, tracing. So all the HTTP calls in my application, they're traced. So I have a long pole endpoint where my web page is calling once in a while. So I can see the long pole calls. I have the conversation endpoint where Dialogflow is calling. So I can click on conversation and I can see the calls that are being made and when they are being made. And if I click on the actual call itself, I can also see what's being called underneath. So here I see that conversation calls Dialogflow app, Dialogflow calls conversation, and then that eventually ends up in BigQuery call that we just made. So all this stuff is there. Um, and the other thing is the error reporting. So if you look at error reporting, my application, it has some timeout issues that I didn't fix on purpose, so I can show it to you. So as you can see, there's timeout exceptions that's been happening. I can see how often they happened and if I can link to an issue, if there's an issue in it, and I can get someone to be called if I want to. So it's very useful as well. Um, but the thing that I want to show before I finish my talk is debugging. So what I do, what you can do in debugging is that first you point to your source code and add, you can go here, add source code and point to GitHub. They will load your code here. It won't load it in Google Cloud, so we won't see your code. It will only load it in the browser. Then, then you, you can see your code just like here and you can put breakpoints. So for example, this vision search handler is the handler that gets called when we search for an image, right? So I can come here and I can just say, yeah, I want to look at the search term, for example. Maybe there's something wrong with the search term. So I can do a breakpoint here. And now what's happening is that stack driver is waiting for this to be hit. When it gets hit, um, it will take a snapshot of the call and all the variables, but it will continue running. So it won't stop anything. So if we go back just to see that this is working, if we go back to our application, uh, let's do this. And let's say, I want to use Vision API. Okay, you can ask Vision API to search for images first. What do you want to search for? Search for images of London. Found some pictures of London. Now, select a picture. Now, if you go back here, as you can see, I mean, you, you couldn't really see, but what happened is that this actually captured. It was already captured, and I can already see that search term is London, right? So, but the, my application is running. It's in the production. I mean, to me, this is really valuable because anyone who has done any kind of production debugging knows how hard it is and how hard it is to instrument your code and application. So having this is, is very, very valuable for me. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Let me just double check. Yeah, that's stack driver, and yeah, that's all I have to to say. Uh, if you want the slides, this is my Twitter. I already have the slides from two days ago. Um, and if you want to have the code, this is a link to GitHub. You can there's a README there that that explains how to set it up yourself. Um, it's not that complicated, so you can play with it if you want. And yeah, I guess in the last five ten minutes, we can have some questions. Are there any questions? So I. Don't see any questions right now. There's definitely a lot of people out there in the chat room that are interested and have been been tuning in and watching with us. Now, um, you have a real long link there. Can you do me a favor and send me the link to that repository back in back in an email a little bit later, and we'll make sure we okay. attach that link to the video, the, the recording for this, so that folks are able to get it because we want to make sure that people are able to get to that demo because, man, you showed some really cool stuff. That was cool. That was cool. So I love how, right, I mean, we're really showing just how across everything .NET is, right? We worked with, you saw Google Home, you saw, uh, right, uh, GKE, you saw all this on a Mac. All of it on a Mac, which is what I'm using. Exactly, um, yeah. I mean, three years ago, you couldn't think of this, and now I run everything on Mac, running on Linux, you know, that's amazing. Absolutely. It's absolutely amazing. I had a question about that cloud. Um, that awesome image cloud. Uh, 
What's that? Mind if I ask what that's rated? Is that all? I mean, that was in your browser, wasn't it? That was amazing looking. Uh, we, which cloud you mean? Uh, the the universe visualization. Yeah. Oh, the the Vision API uh, thing. That was neat looking. I really really like that. It kind of reminded me of a graph. Yeah, it's API. a it's a demo. Maybe 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 you can attach that to the sh uh, show notes as well. Like it's a demo that's available. It's public, and it just it shows Vision API basically in a visual way. Yeah, very, very cool stuff. Uh, Ultra Hall in the chat room is saying .NET is wicked cool in the correct hands. So compliments to you. Mm -hmm. Very good stuff. Thank you, yeah. And compliments to people who created .NET Core, to be honest. That's good. I like that. It's it, Right? That's the point of the open source. It Everybody's is. collaborated, and we're all getting very cool stuff out of this. Well, I think, uh, I think that's all we're going to have time here. Thank you so much for joining us, Mate. This is great. We really appreciate it. You know, golf clap for yeah, you, thanks, sir. Thanks very much for having me. It, it was, again, a lot of fun. Yeah.